The journey began on, on what I would call a, a bridge of history. How many of you have been to Sarajevo? And, okay, and how many of you have been to the bridge where the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand took place, right on the corner? It's, it's an amazing place to go and you feel the history come alive. And you think about what it, was, what it would have been like back then to see Archduke Franz Ferdinand arrive in all his glory on June 28th. And to realize that lying in wait are these teenagers, many of them, very young Serbian nationalists from an obscure set of conflicts that the world media was not paying much attention to. The yearnings of Serbian nationalists were not high on the radar. But here was this triumphant journey of Archduke Franz Ferdinand with his wife Sophie down these beautiful streets of cobblestone on horse and carriage. And there was this bungled assassination attempt that started with a failed bomb and a guy jumps off a bridge and gets picked up in the river and another person, the gun doesn't work. And it finally comes to this young, 19-year-old Serbian nationalist who actually pulls the trigger. One small, they, have an, an, uh, they actually have the revolver and it's so small and, and sweaty. <laughs> and you think, how could this little tiny gun change history in such extraordinary ways? How is it that um, Gavrilo Princip, the, the assassin, 19 years old, could alter history so dramatically. When I was sitting there on that bridge contemplating all this, I, I realized you know, I'm supposed to be doing some reporting. So uh, you got to stop reflecting at some point and, and start doing your reporting. And, and as we talked to young people in Sarajevo, what we learned was that Serbian nationalist yearning has not gone away because there was a peace agreement in Dayton that ended the war in the Balkans. Those yearnings are rumbling. And, and the, the, the potential for conflict, I think, is still smoldering. We're not aware of that. And I really heard that on the streets. But after doing my work, I actually had some time um, to stop, think about the next part of my journey. And I'm just sitting on the bridge thinking about all this history. And I'm thinking about the maps of World War I. And I'm thinking about Sykes-Pico. You can't really understand the impact of World War I today without knowing a lot about the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And I really, I hate to sound like my old history professor, but like go back and look it up. This is something you need to know. Um, British diplomatic advisor Sir Mark Spikes had a French counterpart, Francois-Georges Picot. Uh, they were undergoing what were considered secret Anglo-French talks that would create a document called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which essentially carved up the world. The powers, mostly the British, the French, somewhat the United States sign off on this, but it was mostly the British and the French saying, we're going to carve up the world. And it's an amazing thing if you really look at the drafts of the map and how the British literally draw a large circle around Mosul, because there's something there they might need called oil. <laughs> the French were more concerned with the Levant, and the Brits thought, you can have it. We want Mosul. We want oil. We want Iraq. And the world was getting divided up in this way for colonial convenience, and you could say colonial arrogance. And those lines, literally drawn in the sand that created modern nations like Iraq, were absolute creations of a post-war agreement. The, the Sykes-Picot Agreement was worked out during the war with the expectation that when they win it, let's not argue at the end. Let's get this worked out now. Fateful document, important to understand. So there I am on the bridge trying to conjure up all my history of Sykes-Pico and think of how I'm going to tell this story. And as any of you know, um, when, when you're bored in this day and age, you break out your phone, you just check in, right? So I thought I'd just check in. So I go online, and I use my phone to check my email, and I get a few things at work. Then I, suddenly I get pinged with all these Twitter feeds because I was on a Twitter feed following the events in Iraq and Syria. This is, the, this is the time, these are the days that the Islamic State emerged, really broke forward on the horizon in ways that surprised me. I did not know what this group was all about. Didn't understand how something that dark was emerging out of a very opaque, uh, quote, opposition in Syria 
But it was becoming pretty clear in these days. Do you remember this? Over, do you remember how surprised we were? Who are these guys? Where is this coming from? They were just breaking across the lines from Syria into Iraq, defying the borders. And they were live tweeting their invasion into Iraq, into Mosul. So I'm thinking, wow, this is, I'm reading this online, thinking this, this is amazing history, so alive. So I'm also following ISIS on Twitter. Strange as a journalist that ISIS is pushing its message. I used to have to be brave enough to cross a checkpoint to go talk to Hezbollah because they couldn't get their message out any other way. I used to have to drive into Gaza, meet with Hamas, or I would be able to go into certain back roads of Belfast to talk with someone from the IRA or Sinn Féin, the political wing. These days, they're pushing their content. These days, they don't need us. And in this moment, my colleague and friend, James Foley, was being held by ISIS. He had been picked up two years earlier. We knew he was in their clutches. We didn't know the ambitions of this group. It was all coming very clear. And it was a perilous moment for us as we saw this group suddenly burst forth. So I'm thinking all this stuff, and I'm following the Twitter feed. And then I realized that the, that the way ISIS is tweeting it out is under the hashtag, which is how you organize key phrases. The hashtag they were sending out is Sykes Pico Over. <laughs> 